Uh, so I do writing, I do uh, the trip, lead trips, and, uh, and teach these workshops. Uh, I also work with Audubon Society of Northern Virginia and Loudon Wildlife Conservancy and Prince William Conservation Alliance, et cetera, et cetera. A um, little bit about the Northern Virginia Bird Club. We've been around since 1954. We have about 500 members and uh, you can join for just $10 a month. I mean, it's $10 a year, I'm sorry. $10 a year is not much. Uh, and we work with uh, groups in Central America for uh, all, all our uh, extra donations go to them. And they work with indigenous kids down there uh, to do birding camps. So that's a nice charity that we do. And we have meetings in Arlington where we have different speakers, scientists and people on trips. And so it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. I also do butterflies. I just did a butterfly count yesterday, and I did a butterfly uh, pro Zoom meeting uh, about that la a week ago today. So, uh, but today we're going to do backyard birds, and we'll just kind of we're not going to get too complicated about. It. I'm not going to give you scientific names or anything, but we'll we'll talk about uh, what you might see in the backyard and a little story about them. Uh, I'll. You might want to turn your volume up if you can't hear me. I'll speak up. Can everybody hear me? Thumbs up? Yes? Okay, good. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and start my, my uh, presentation then. So here it is. There we go. Share. Let me go to, uh, hang on. Go to the middle beginning. Slideshow from beginning. There we go. That's what we want. All right, backyard birds. So these are birds that can all be found in Northern Virginia, different times of the year. I'm not going to focus just on one season. So what you're looking at here is, uh, I'll talk about this more later, but this is a, a ruby-throated hummingbird, and that's the only hummingbird we have breeding in our area. So uh, there, this is a female, doesn't have the ruby throat, as you can see. So basically, you can divide birds into four groups. Some birds are here all the time, all seasons, all year, like Carolina wren. So they don't migrate. They're, they're here all the time. Some of them you only have here in the breeding season, like this guy. This is a prothonotary warbler. And... Uh, this is interesting. They got their names because the uh, accountants for the Pope and the Vatican have yellow robes like this, and they're called protho notaries. So that's where they got the name. They're, they're, I guess their color is exactly the same as the uh, accountants in the Vatican, but we pronounce it prothonotary. These birds you can find along the water, along Potomac River. They're uh, going to perch, they're going to nest in trees near water, and they have a very uh, distinctive song. But they're not gonna be in your backyard usually, <laughs> example. Here's another one you might have in your backyard, although this is more of a rural bird. This is a group of birds that are only here in the winter. Sparrows, certain ducks, things like that are only gonna be here in the winter. And then they migrate, like we're south for them basically is the idea. So they flew south and they, they stopped here. All right, and then you have birds only here during migration. They only come through. This is an American red start. It is a warbler. They're actually very common where they are, but they don't breed in our area. So, but we see a lot of them come through in May and then on the return journey in, uh, in fall, like September, October. So this one I photographed in Alexandria actually. So, just give you a real quick overview of the parts of the bird. I'm not going to get too in the weeds here, but we talk about the crown of the bird, like that last one, the white crown sparrow. That's a white crown. Throat, uh, breast, uh, wings. Sometimes they have wing bars. That's an important thing to look at. We talk about the rump, which is this area. So, a leg collar can be a way to tell these birds apart. Um, sometimes you have. Their face can be an important thing. Like when you're identifying birds, eye ring can really stand out. It's something you can look at. The white-throated sparrow. So uh, 
and the beak color. Beak color and beak shape is also very important here. Okay, so one bird you often see in your backyard is this northern cardinal. And uh, this is a state bird of Virginia. And they do have a red bill. Unlike, they don't have a yellow bill. A, a lot of times in pictures, you sh they show them the yellow bill, but they don't have that. So this is the male. And one thing we talk about in birds is the sexual dimorphism. You can see, I took this picture during the snowmageddon, and you can see the male and then the female on the right, who's very, a lot more, uh, less colorful. Birds are sort of the opposite of people. The males are actually more pretty. So, and the females are more dull looking. And uh, we call the sexual dimorphism because there's a difference between the sexes in the birds. And sometimes, sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. Cardinals, definitely. And this is so that the, the uh, females can sit on the eggs in the nest and they'll be less, uh, they'll be more hidden from predators. It'll be much harder for them to find them. So that's why we have, and the males, they want to sit out and they, they want to be noticed by the females and the other birds. So they're, uh, they're very colorful. And, and the females like the more colorful males. So that's also led to sexual selection over the centuries. So we have uh, males that are getting more and more colorful, I guess, through the ages. So here's one you'll hear often in your, uh, in your uh, yard, the morning dove. It's the only real dove we have around here. Let's see, you probably hear this. They all start singing early in the uh, spring, and that's kind of a sign of spring, sometimes in the winter even. Did you hear this? Turn this up. Okay. Let's see. You hear that? Can you hear that? That's the morning dove. Good, and here's it. And they're called more, okay, this is enough, this is a related rock pigeons. And obviously we know those are around, they're all over the world. And we, we uh, they're related to doves. We used to actually call these rock doves and then they changed it back to rock pigeons. They were brought over by the early settlers from Europe and they're just everywhere now. Although they're usually only in uh, suburb, usually in suburban or rural or uh, urban areas. You'll see them in rural areas around barns and things sometimes, but often out in the country, you don't see them much because they're definitely acclimated to getting food in the cities and around people. Okay, this is one of my favorites. This is the Carolina chickadee. They're another one that's here year round. Now we don't have black cap chickadees in this area. A lot of people get those confused. Black capped is a different species than Carolina chickadee. Carolina chickadees are very cool. Uh, they're here all year round. They're also cavity nesters. Uh, sometimes I have them in my bluebird houses. They'll uh, make a big mat of moss to nestle their eggs in. So they're, they're very busy. And then they spend all their time feeding their babies. They're, they're interesting because they'll hang out with flocks of other birds, like make big flocks of birds, especially in the fall. Because the chickadees are very active and they're very attentive and, and they're, they're like kind of the security for the other birds. And the other birds will respond to their calls. They actually have calls that are different for something in the air, like a hawk, that's a threat, or something on the ground, like people or snakes. So the birds will actually listen to the chickadees' calls and they'll know which way to go based on what the chickadee is telling them. So it's, uh, so it's very handy to have chickadees around if you're a bird. There's another guy, this is obviously taken in the winter, the tufted titmouse. We have those around all year. And uh, they're another one that'll be, uh, they're, they're related, similar to chickadees that they'll be in a mixed flock and uh, hanging out with the other birds, especially warblers that come through, we'll hook up with them. Uh, titmice are interesting because they'll stash food a lot. I wrote an article about them, uh, I don't know, last year, and they'll come in and uh, take food from your feeder 
then they'll go and stash it somewhere, maybe 20, 30 yards away. So uh, not all food they grab, they're eating. So they'll just have all these stashes everywhere. They'll eat some of it, of course. But uh, they're definitely cute little guys. Here's another one, the nuthatch. Very similar, another little little bird. We call these a little passerines. They're uh, they're going to be uh, often come into your feeders. I'm sure, you've seen them. They have uh, they have an interesting. Let's see if I can find it. Sorry, I have to. There we go. Sorry. Give you the call for them. Um, this is the one that we have here. There's another one called Red Breasted Nuthatch was only on here uh, sometimes. That's the Nuthatch. Real, real kind of like a laughing. It sounds like they're yucking, yucking it up. And uh, they're they're also going to be ones that like to store food. They'll find holes in trees to stuff the food in. Here's another one. This is a Carolina wren. These are also very common. Uh, usually, they're one of the first birds to start singing in the morning. You've probably heard they have a tea kettle tea kettle song. It's uh. And they're, I think they're one of the loudest birds, pound for pound. You'll definitely see them. You can hear that's a tea kettle, tea kettle song. They have a lot of different songs they do. Another one. You can hear that. They have this hissing scold song they do. There's so many vocalizations that these Carolina wrens do. And they'll, uh, they're interesting because they'll nest anywhere. People get them in their garage, in their mailboxes, who knows where. They're just, uh, they don't seem to care. They're not that afraid of people either. Uh, they usually feed off the ground. They're, during one of the big uh, blizzards, I kept putting food out. I think I saved a couple of their lives because I kept putting food out my back door and uh, clean, clearing the snow off, putting more seeds. They just kept coming in, just like just a few feet from me because they were so hungry. So, uh, here's another one you might have. Uh, this is a house wren. It's a different kind of wren. And they live, uh, are only here in the breeding season. These guys are interesting because they'll, uh, their nests are sticks. They just get a big pile of sticks and they'll stuff it into a, a cavity like a bluebird box. So I find, I'm, I find my box is full of sticks. And the only problem is they'll also make dummy nests. So the male will fill up, you know, three or four boxes full of sticks and the female will choose one of them. So uh, I, I usually just feel if there are any eggs, I won't bother it. But if I think it's a dummy nest, I'll take them out usually. But, but these guys, uh, they're, they're very active and you often hear them in your neighborhood. Here's the ruby-throated hummingbird. I photographed this one in Delaware. This one is the male, so you can see the ruby throat. And uh, this is the only one we have around in breeding season. Now in the winter, you can get rare hummingbirds from the West sometimes. So uh, I've had, uh, I don't know, I think four other species of hummingbirds I found in Virginia. You, we get a rare bird alert. That's how birding works uh, often. Uh, we get it through the grapevine or, or different apps or websites that tell us that a rare bird is somewhere. So we'll make an arrangement to go out and see it. Or sometimes, uh, you, you know, 100 people will just show up at different times during the day to see a rare bird. That happened a couple of weeks ago in Chantilly. There was a, a rare big sandpiper called a ruff. So uh, I, I put the alert out on the uh, listserv, Virginia Bird listserv, and then uh, people just showed up all day to see it. Only lasted two days, so got to see it while you can, right? So that's one thing exciting about birding is, is finding rare stuff that you've never seen before or haven't seen in the state. 
that one I'd seen in Delaware years ago, but never in Virginia. So that was exciting. Some people say birding is kind of a cross between hunting and stamp collecting because you're out there, you're, you're, you're looking for the birds, you're out in nature, but you also want to kind of collect them, collect the sightings of them, maybe get a photograph or, or so there's different ways of birding. Some people are a little more hardcore about that. They just want to check the bird off and move on. I like to study what the bird's doing a little more and kind of look on vicariously in its life, what it's doing. And uh, we actually uh, are just finishing up a breeding, a statewide Virginia breeding bird survey, which is where we do exactly that. It's uh, hundreds and hundreds of people have done this study and we've split the state up into into squares and uh, we, we've uh, studied the birds and we're trying to confirm who's breeding and who's not and we send the data in and uh, that's almost done it's been very successful we've actually covered mo much of the state so uh, it's just winding up now because breeding season is winding up so there might be a few more uh, we all a few more observations and birds to confirm, but, but not too many. We're almost at 100,000 uh, records, actually. 100,000 lists, I should say. So that's been very successful. Dr. Ashley Peel has been running that, and she's amazing. So moving on, we have uh, three kinds of birds that we call corvids. So uh, we have two kinds of crows. This is the American crow. This is a fish crow. And the only way to tell them apart really is by their call. So you probably know, I'm sure you've heard both of these. The American crow has the traditional caw, 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 call, right? And uh, you've heard in the cartoons or whatever. And I know you've heard that. So let's see. Bones. Oh. Okay, anyway. There we go. We all know that call, right? Okay, so the other one is the fish crow. That one is more like. So it sounds like it's saying, uh-uh. So what I say is the way to figure out which crow is which, since they pretty much look the same, is to ask them. You say, are you an American crow? And if they go, uh-uh, uh-uh, that means they're a fish crow. So you just ask them. That's the best way to tell. They're very, usually they're pretty cooperative. And uh, there's a lot of these around. Fish crows are usually the ones you're going to see in the parking lots of the grocery store or Walmart or whatever. And uh, they're, they're, sometimes you'll see an American crow, but most of them are fish crows. And you'll hear that, uh-uh, uh-uh. All the time. Now, another bird that's related to them, believe it or not, are blue jays. Blue jays are also corvids, and they're related to crows. That's why they're so loud and active and really smart. Corvids are one of the smartest groups of birds in the world. In fact, I think they're actually smarter than a lot of mammals. There are these crows in uh, New Caledonia that use tools and they can even uh, make the tools and they can actually teach other birds to use the tools. So they make tools, they teach about the tools and they use them. It's, it's pretty amazing. And the crows here are really smart too. If somebody mistreats crows, a crow, all the other crows will remember and uh, have it in against that person. So they'll recognize the person the next time. So that's pretty interesting too. Blue jays are really loud, but they're also mimics. So they'll, they'll do a impression of a red-shouldered hawk or a, or a red-tailed hawk. Not sure why they do that, but they're pretty good at it. 
So uh, when we're out in the field and we hear a red-shouldered hawk, we have to kind of think twice. Is that a uh, blue jay or is that a hawk? So somebody you got to get away to sec. Even in your backyard, it would be the same. You're not sure which one you're hearing. I'll talk about the hawks in a minute. Here's one you're going to have in your backyard, the house sparrow. Not a native bird. They were brought here uh, in the 19th century. And uh, eh, males are pretty. It's a ni not a bad looking bird. But they're not related to our sparrows at all. They're, they're a European sparrow. Uh, we don't like them because they will kill bluebirds. They'll go in the house and they'll, they'll peck the eggs or kill the babies and try to take over. And then they build these nests full of uh, grass and, and trash. Often they'll have trash like woven in. But, you know, that's, that's their lot in life to be an, a nuisance. And they are actually considered a nuisance bird. So here's a native sparrow. This is the song sparrow. And they're a backyard bird, very common. You can tell uh, they look a lot different than this sparrow. They got the long tail here. They've got the heavy streaking, and you'll uh, you'll hear them in your neighborhood. Let's see if I can find the song here. So, usually I have another person doing this part for me, but uh, that's fine. All right. So that, that's a song you could often hear in your neighborhood. Still going. All right. Just give you an idea. Here's another one. This is one of my favorite photos. This is a white-throated sparrow. And the reason it's one of my favorites is because I got paid for it. Uh, somebody asked to use it, and it uh, turned out it was for a book called Secrets of Backyard Birding Success. And they paid me 125 bucks for it. So uh, I was pleased about that. That was very surprising. I actually took this through a window. I was uh, seeing a really rare bird from someone's, uh, that was in someone's backyard. And he was really nice. He let everyone go into his kitchen to, to see the bird because it was dead of winter and really cold. And this guy just popped down on the, win on the uh, windowsill there. And I just took this picture randomly while I was waiting for the rare uh, very thrush, which was a, a western bird, which we we're all there for. So uh, that was a nice bonus. And these guys are interesting too because they are native sparrow, but they'll come in a tan morph too. This area here, well, some of them, this area is not bright white like this, it's tan. And the birds will usually breed with their opposite number. So the white morph tan will breed with the tan morph. And it's, it's pretty interesting. And they have a little bit different personalities too. These white morphs are more uh, aggressive, a little more assertive. And the uh, tan morph guys are a little bit more of a homebody, a little more mellow. So it's interesting. This is a junco. You have those in your backyard in the winter. Sometimes people call them snowbirds. These are easy to tell. They've got the black top, the white bellies, little pink bill. And you, when they fly, you see the white on their tails fan out. And uh, you can actually see these in the summer up in the mountains. They actually do breed in the mountains. But uh, down where we are in Northern Virginia, you only see them in the winter. And sometimes there's a lot of them. Love your feeder. This is the Eastern Toey. This is actually also a sparrow, believe it or not. And uh, there's going to be a few of these in the winter, but mostly they're here in the summer. And they definitely breed here. And they have an interesting song. Tell me if you think this sounds like. You can hear that. Sounds like drink your tea. So he's saying, Drink your tea. <laughs> so like we're out there, we're here, and he's going, drink your tea. Or we go, yes. Oh, we don't have any tea. I'm sorry. But 
But uh, this one, this one, I was lucky. I was in uh, Arlington, and uh, where was I? Potomac Overlook Park. That's right. And he just popped down right next to my uh, car, and I just happened to have my camera, and I just uh, was able to get his photo right before he flew away. So that was a lucky. Sometimes these uh, nice shots are very lucky. Here's a nice one. You guys have these American goldfinch, and these. Uh, these are interesting because they're only starting to breed about now. They don't breed early in the year because their babies are only vegetarians. Other birds will feed their babies uh, worms and insects and things. But the uh, goldfinches, once in a while, apparently they will give them a worm or something, but 99% of their food is vegetarian. And uh, in the winter, they're here, but they're not as bright colored. So the males will turn more yellow in this summer to attract the ladies, I guess. So uh, that's, that's an interesting, and you can see he's on the sunflower. They love seeds. This is a house finch. This is actually one of the first photos I took. Um, he's got this huge finch bill here. Again, big seed lover. Um, once in a while, we have another bird called a purple finch, only in the winter, and they're pretty rare. Not here every year either. Males related. Here's the robin. We all know the robin, right? This is the American robin. So there's also a, a robins in England, but they're not related at all. Uh, I think when the uh, Europeans came over, they saw this bird and it looks superficially like their bird, so they just named it a robin. But it's not. It, these robins that we have are actually related to thrushes. They're a thrush. And they're not a sign of spring. We have them all year round. When they start singing, that's a sign of spring. Sign of spring. But uh, people, I, you see it a lot. Like, oh, I saw a robin. Spring must be coming. It's like, no, they're always here. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, they're still nice to see. But they're not a sign of spring. Sorry. Uh, here's the bluebird. Love me some bluebirds. Um, this is a male. Very pretty. Uh, so, I mentioned I do a bluebird trail. We have bluebird houses. I do bluebird houses. I monitor in Springfield, Virginia, not in Springfield, in Vienna, Virginia, on the WNOD trail. And bluebirds were really hurting, especially back in the 70s, because starlings and house sparrows were taking over their houses, their, uh, which are cavities, which were in trees. So there's this nationwide effort to build these houses for them, and they've really bounced back and are doing really well. So uh, I have a t we have a team of four people. We alternate weeks, and we basically monitor them, see how they're doing, pull out the house sparrow nests, but uh, and then we send our data in, uh, and it's a, it's a nationwide effort, and they're doing pretty well. Here's an example. This is a box with baby birds in it. You can see the baby bluebirds. And they make this nice nest here, round nest of grass. So there's the babies. And uh, these guys look like uh, they're maybe a week old. So they'll get big and they'll jump out of the nest eventually. All right. Now, we do have hawks in our area. This is one I took in my backyard. This is an adult Cooper's hawk. And it's eating a bird. So uh, I don't know what kind of bird it was. But they'll hunt bird feeders. Very good at that. Here's another one. This is a, a same species, believe it or not. Same as that. This is a juvenile. This is a baby one. Or right, he's probably a year old or two. But uh, it's hard to be a hawk because you got to learn how to hunt. And a lot of them don't make it because it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. So that's why we, in the winter we see a lot of juveniles. And they don't all become adults. Here's another hawk we have, the red-shouldered hawk. Uh, I took this picture in Ashburn. These are actually pretty common around here. They like the wetlands. They like any snakes and frogs, uh, sometimes mammals. And this is one you'll see. Uh, this is the red-tailed hawk. And these guys, uh, you'll see them perched around the beltway often. I've seen a lot of them. They'll, they'll sit up there. They'll sit up and they'll look around because they have very, you know, the hawk eye, very strong vision. They'll look for prey from their perch. 
and uh, they'll eat mice and rabbits, whatever they can catch. They're pretty common around here too. And most of the country, this is the most common hog. I think here in our area, these two are both about the same in frequency, all right? This is a barred owl. That's the most common owl we have. Again, they're gonna be in the stream valley parts. So, let's see. No, it didn't. So this one also has a very cool call. There we go. Who cooks for you? Who cooks for y'all? <laughs> and then this past spring, I saw my first baby barred owl. So talk about cute. This was at Dyke Marsh in uh, along Potomac River. Baby owl, there is actually, there were two of them there. So uh, this, this guy, so you can see it looks similar, similar face, right? This is the baby. He still got all the down on him. And uh, the, the parents were uh, feeding him still. So that was cool. This is a cedar waxwing. This is a really beautiful bird. They're, uh, they're here all the time. In the winter, they're in big flocks as they move place to place to get uh, food, to get berries and things. And they use this little tail for a, as a signal flag. All right. And here's a big flock of them, as I mentioned. So uh, this is the mockingbird. You've probably seen these. They'll do uh, songs. Usually they'll do other bird songs usually three or four times before they switch to a new one. And this is a brown thrasher, mostly only here in the summer. They're related. You can see how they're kind of the same shape. And they'll, they also are mimics. They'll do each song about twice when they sing. It's eating some kind of beetle there. This is a cat bird. They're also related. They're also a mimid. This one I took in my parents' backyard. And they, uh, they meow. They actually do meow like a cat. That's why they're called a cat bird. And they'll also do mimics, but they'll just kind of make a big hash, big garble of different songs. They'll just kind of all go together. So you might hear that in your bushes. All right. This one you might not have in your backyard, but you might. It's a wild turkey. I just like the picture. <laughs> Finally got a male displaying. It's the only time I've gotten that. And you got the starlings. This is another invasive bird, not native. They are brought here by a guy in New York in the, in the 1800s. And a few of them were released in New York. Now they're everywhere. It's just millions and millions of them everywhere. This is another black, this is a blackbird. It's a grackle. Uh, they'll come to your feeder and they'll just eat everything because they're big and they're very hungry. So that's a, uh, a grackle. Brown-headed cowbird. These are interesting. You can see the male and there's the female. These guys lay their eggs in other birds' nests. They're called nest parasites. And uh, so but they'll hang around and kind of make sure that they're cared for. But they don't lay the eggs themselves uh, in their own nests. So uh, that's, uh, and that, that actually is very harmful to certain birds because the cowbirds are bigger than the, than the, birds uh, that the parents are ready for and they'll uh, they'll outcompete the birds uh, that are supposed to be in that nest so got a few woodpeckers I'll mention real quick downy woodpecker little the little black and white one you'll see in your backyard very common another common bird in your backyard is the red bellied it's got this uh, checkerboard pattern on its back and, um, and sometimes you'll see a red belly. It's not a great name for it, but sometimes. And then the pileated woodpecker. This is a big, like a woody woodpecker type woodpecker. And uh, they're very loud. And you might, you might see them in your backyard. They'll come, come, come to feeders. One of my favorites. They're big. The flicker. This is a yellow shafted. You can see the yellow tail feathers and yellow wings underneath. 
That's another one. Also a woodpecker. And just want to mention real quick that native trees provide more caterpillars for birds than non-native trees. So native plants, if you want to attract birds and insects and food for birds, native plants are way better than exotics because our insects are evolved to eat native plants, not non-native plants. There's another book. This is a good book by Doug Ptolemy called Bringing Nature Home, where he talks about all that. You can see how native plants are so much better for wildlife. He says, if you have a backyard, this book is for you. So, all right, well, that's all I got. Thank you. This is a peregrine falcon that I photographed in Florida, the fastest bird in the world. So, there you go. Thank you. Did we lose? Oh, we lost. Yeah. Right. Well, thanks. That was great. If anybody has any questions, um, you can unmute yourself and, and go ahead and yeah, let uh, me know. ask them. And, or if you're too shy, you can type them in the chat. Yeah. yeah I'm used to doing this with a live audience, usually. So, <laughs> getting feedback is a little, I feel like I'm talking to myself, but it's fine. That's good. I'm getting used to it. <laughs> Larry, what is the, is there any average amount of time for birds to fledge? Uh, depends on the bird. Um, eagles will take, we could take a couple of months. A bluebird will fledge in about two weeks or so. Two and a half weeks, depending. So uh, yeah, the smaller birds are quicker than the bigger birds. Yes, that's a good question. And uh, we, when we do the bluebirds, we have to keep track of them because if you open the box too quick, they'll jump out because they're just ready to fledge. But if it's too early, they shouldn't be coming out yet. So you got to kind of peek in and make sure they don't, don't jump out. I've had that happen. And I just got to scoop them up and put them back in. But uh, they'll come out when they're ready. Larry, uh, yes, what is, yeah, what are some of the best ways to learn bird calls? Um, there are different apps, and there's, uh, there's uh, Cornell has some sites, ways to learn, birding by ear, we call it. Uh, so uh, if you Google birding by ear classes, or I have an app, I have the uh, Sibley app, I'll show you um, this one. So uh, like here's the, uh, so if I go to, uh, Oh, what did I do? Like when I showed you the barred owl. So I go here. You can see. I don't know. A lot of glare. But on here, there's the owl. And then there's the songs are up top. That's on right. what app? Yeah, this is Sibley. Sibley, S-I-B-L-E-Y? Correct. Right. And there's also an Audubon app. There's Cornell. There's a lot of different bird apps. And they'll have the songs on them. So if I'm out in the field, what I'll do is, uh, if I'm not sure what it is, I'll play it gently because I don't want to disturb the birds. I'll play it to my ear and then uh, try to say, oh, well, that sounds like the right one. Okay. Or if I'm leading a walk, I'll play it for people and say, that's what we're hearing, you know. Okay, thank you. It does, it's the hardest part. It does, I, sometimes I don't know what I'm hearing. So, yeah. <laughs> you know. Thank you very much for being there. I appreciate it. Oh, well, thanks for coming. Larry, what was your, I mean, I know, are you from this area originally? Uh, since the early 70s, yeah. Okay. I mean, do you have like your favorite bird like that you have seen either in this area or just when you've been around? Uh, I really like the snowy owl. <laughs> the big white owl. And we had a bunch of them here uh, a few years ago. There was one at Springfield Mall. And uh, there was ones, uh, there were a bunch of them around here. Uh, so uh, the one at Springfield Mall, a lot of people went to see that one. It was hanging out on the Macy's building. <laughs> and, uh, I talked to a Washington Post reporter. I got in the paper about that one. A uh, little, little interview about the snowy owl. So I also like, uh, gosh, you know, I've seen, uh, you know, over 600 birds. So it's not, oh, the albatross. I saw it west was cool. Walt Lace and Albatross. And uh, puffins are neat. Uh, and then warblers. All the warblers, very nice. 
So it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's kind of a confluence of being rare and being cool. It's hard to say. <laughs> Although common birds are nice too. You know, cardinals are beautiful, even though they're common. So uh, I say some of these birds, if they weren't so common, everyone would go wild about them. <laughs> what is the resource that you've um, said that you can get a hold of to find out what birds are being seen in the area? Okay, so you can go, uh, eBird is the best. So you can get a free, uh, you can get a free uh, account there and it'll tell you. You can click on any park anywhere and I'll tell you what's being seen. Now, if you want a, a rare bird alert, they also give you rare bird alerts too. You can sign up for rare birds on eBird. But there's also a listserv called VA Bird, uh, listserv.com. So if you just Google that, that one is where we will send out bird reports uh, through emails. So we'll, we'll tell everyone, uh, so it gives you more details about where you can see the birds that are rare. Would you so repeat that, bird? VA dash bird. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And you can sign, that's again, that's free. You can sign up for that. And, uh, you know, when I do when I lead a walk, I'll put, I'll put down uh, what we saw on the walk and give people the link to the eBird list. But eBird is the best for uh, keeping track of your, uh, what you've seen, too. So I can go, I can go, I can tell you what I saw in my yard in uh, 2010, you know, <laughs> because it's all in the data, data bank for eBird. Where are some of your favorite places to bird in the area? Um, so I like uh, Huntley Meadows is great. Dyke Marsh. I lead walks at Dyke Marsh. When we're, we're not doing right now, but when we start up again. That's, uh, Dyke Marsh is on the GW Parkway, just uh, just east of, old, of, of Alexandria there, Old Town Alexandria. That's nice. Uh, Occoquan Bay good there's a place in Haymarket called silver lake and then the best place to see the warblers up close monticello park in alexandria yeah. is legendary that's been it's a small little park but for some reason all the warblers and thrushes and who knows what just shows up there every year in spring and uh, they'll come right down to your feet it's, it's amazing so that that's that's a premier place, but there's a lot of places to go around here. You can go to the mountains. You can go to the, the you can go to Chincoteague. Chincoteague is great. That's one of my favorites. It's farther away, but you'll get totally different birds there. So that's the thing about Virginia. We got the seashore, we got the Piedmont area, and then we got the mountains. So there's a wide variety of things you can see here. Yep. All right, well, if there's no other questions, thank you so much, Larry, for being with us today. Sure, hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Sorry thank you, people, Larry, very much. Sorry people had audio issues. I don't yeah. know, did my best. <laughs> okay, well, thank, thank you. you, goodbye. Thanks, Bye. see you later. Have a good day. All right, have a good one. All righty, thank you, Anne. No, thank you so much. I feel like it was very interesting. <laughs>